and uh, we have a lot to cover tonight. Potentially, this could being the last class of the 18 course series, um, short of next week's review, which I pray you'll all be able to come to with Master John. Um, potentially, one could teach the whole all the ACI courses in this class. There's a sense in which they're all encompassed in it. Uh, and I highly recommend that you listen to Gisha Michael's um, recording from this class, the so class 10 of, of course 18, uh, because I won't cover exactly the same material that he did. Uh, he actually went through the six flavors or the six layers of um, ethics Mahamudra in that class, and it's very succinct and very beautiful, and uh, so I highly recommend you listen to that. I'm actually going to try to focus more on what I see to be um, maybe some of our trouble points, and I really would love your feedback too. If questions came clear to you, whether in the meditation or prior to the class, what are your deepest unanswered questions? Um, because in a sense, this class is a, an arc, a sweeping arc, from the Mind Only School that we were working with last week through the two layers of the Middle Way view, the independent group with the Svatantrika and the consequence group with the Prasantrika. And I have actually made it um, the subject of my own intensive research for oh, years now to understand this class. And I, I, I'm not overestimating to say that. Um, it's really the questions that arise in the juxtapositions of these two schools or, or three parts of schools uh, that the deeper you go, the more the questions arise, and then the deeper you go, the more those answers give rise to new questions. And so I don't expect for a moment that anything will be finished tonight, and I hope you don't think so either. Um, So, without further ado, I think let's just jump in. I'll go very quickly through some questions uh, and spend a long time on others. So, and I just, since I'm thinking of it now, I don't want to forget, um, I've asked Master John um, if he could put up my email address on the board at some point um, so that those of you who are interested in, in uh, being in touch either about some of the uh, writing or, or translation work that I've been doing, I'm very happy to, to share some of that with you if you're interested, but I need to hear from you and I don't want to just sort of send out a blast for things. Um, so jumping to question one, I will not spend too much time on this. There's actually an extensive debate in the reading, uh, which Gisha Michael took from a later um, commentary on James O'Connor's book. And just, uh, I'm realizing there may be people here who weren't here last week just for general review. The book we're studying right now is by Jason Kappa, 1357 to 1419. Uh, and it is a study of the art of interpretation, how to distinguish between teachings that were meant literally and teachings that need interpretation or were spoken figuratively in that there's truth there, but if you took it on face value, it wouldn't be the final truth. And so it raises all these questions of how does one distinguish between different turnings of the wheel, as they're called, um, in which the Buddha taught quite distinctly different and apparently contradictory uh, versions of how, re how reality exists, namely whether it exists inherently with natures of its own, where all the different objects in the world have their own natures. And really, the only thing that we're seeking to find the lack of a self nature to is a self, a personal self. Uh, that would be the first turning of the wheel, or the second turning of the wheel, where Lord Buddha um, quite explicitly said that no object in the universe, including the mind itself, including emptiness itself, has any inherent nature. Uh, and then the third turning of the wheel, where Lord Buddha made fine distinctions um, between those things which really don't have any nature of their own and those things which a lack of self-nature in a very particular way. And we'll say a lot more about that shortly. But the first point that needs to be made here is that when we're discussing these three turnings of the wheel, it's 
it doesn't mean that every sutra that was spoken, for example, in the early part of Buddha's life belongs to the first turning of the wheel in this technical sense. Or it doesn't mean that every sutra spoken in the last period of Lord Buddha's life means, oh, that's, that belongs to the mind-only school. Because if you look at the scope of the sutras, and actually there's uh, a lot of internal evidence from the sutras themselves, they say where and when relative to the Buddha's life, they were spoken. And so if you just went by this criteria that we covered last week as to what constitutes the first, second, and third turning of the wheel, you might start thinking that everything that the Buddha said in the first turning of the wheel should be taken figuratively. Uh, and this point is, that's not true. Uh, because there's an example of um, one of the very first teachings that the Buddha gave to uh, the group of five, who were actually five of his friends from he had known while doing ascetic practices early in, or early in his life, and then they happened to be five of the first people to whom he was able to give teachings because they had that close karmic connection already. Um, and essentially they were his first monks. And so he told them, be sure to wear your lower robes in a neat circle, which is, the whole, um, it's the way that uh, all, pretty much still in all the different Buddhist sanghas, the, the robes are a long tube that's, that's wrapped around in a circle. So if one were to say oh, everything that the Buddha taught in the initial part is, is uh, teaching was to be taken figuratively, then that would imply that even the monastic instructions that he gave are to be taken figuratively. And obviously, that's not the case. Uh, so for those of you ever following the trend, that's the uh, is the fact that the Buddha said, be sure to wear your you know, lower robes in a neat circle. And he said that to the group of five. Uh, so as I said, there's a lot more about that point in the reading, which I think is then secondly, you will notice uh, through this reading that Jitho Kappa is not only interpreting the sutra and then trying to understand what about the sutra should be taken literally or figuratively. We don't have that in this reading, but it does come in the rest of the book that the Buddha actually, I mean, Jitho Kappa eventually will analyze whether the mind-only school's interpretation of the sutra on the true intent of the other sutras is to be taken literally or figured. Um, but he's not only dealing with the sutra, and he's not only dealing with the historical founders of the, the mind-only school, namely Master Sangha, and to some extent his brother, his half-brother, Vasubandhu. Implicitly, Jyotra Kappa is also carrying on a dialogue with other commentators, and he never mentions their names. And this is a very important point that throughout Jitsu Kappa's works, there are frequent places where he criticizes, quite openly criticizes, another view. But he never criticizes a person. And I know you've all heard this before, but it's beautiful, and I actually very recently had the opportunity to speak with a beautiful Tibetan Lama. Um, and it was the one point he made to me. I don't know if I'll ever meet him again. It was actually by a Skype call. But it's one of those things of, uh, it was the one thing he found most important to say about Jetsu Kapp is, do you ever find him criticizing anybody? And I said, well, yes, he does criticize views. I said, but he never mentions name, names. And the Dhamma said, right. He never mentions names. Uh, and he's, un he's somewhat unique in that point. I won't say entirely unique, but there are many Tibetans who quite openly criticize, and we see it in this culture all the time. People criticize by name. People criticize and somehow feel, if I can say who it is I'm criticizing, that somehow gives me more um, power or bite in the criticism. And so it's very beautiful to notice Jitsu Kappa didn't feel the need to do that, because if you could recognize the view that he was criticizing, then you could do all you needed to for your own heart, and it didn't matter who had held it. Um, so in this case, there's a view, and several times he says, anybody who holds the teachings of the third turning of the wheel, specifically this sutra on the true intent of the other sutras, to be literal, but then goes ahead and interprets it this way, it hasn't understood the, the true meaning of the mind only school. And it's very clear that Jason Hukapa wants people to understand the mind-only school as a sangha meant it, as Vasubandha meant it. Um, 
And so one of these cases is that if one were to hold that everything the Buddha taught in the last turning of the wheel was literal, and that's of course what the mind only school said, but if you held that across the board, then that would mean that certain cases where for the sake of disciples who were not even ready to hear basic Buddhist teaching, he said, well, yes, there is a kind of a self. So the Buddha even went so far as to talk about a self as if it existed. Uh, and some of those teachings happened to be in the latter part of his career. And so this is why this point becomes so important, that you can't assume that the whole question of literal and figurative applies to all sutras. It only applies to those sutras that are specifically talking about emptiness and the degree to which things are empty or not empty. That's what has to be interpreted literally or figurative. So these sutras where the Buddha refers to people having a self, obviously we know from the rest of the context of Buddhism have to be interpreted figuratively. Um, even if they happen to have been a part time-wise of the third journey. So this leads to an idea that is still much debated and much perhaps misunderstood uh, and actually has been a bone of contention between the schools of Tibetan Buddhism, not just in ancient India, but between the various schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And that's how it is that the, what the Buddha meant by uh, what's known as the Tathagata Garbha, or the womb of all those who have gone thus. Uh, or else you might call it the essence of those who have gone thus, which really, in common English now, has become Buddha nature. So I know you've all heard that term. And according to the Gelupa interpretation, which is based very much on Jaipo Kappa's, uh, it doesn't appear to me that he, he deals with um, Dishinship in Nimo directly in this, this part of the text. Um, but certainly what he says can be interpreted that way, and, and there are other places in his, in his writings where he very clearly explains that <coughs> this essence of all the Buddhas that we hold within us cannot be something positive, because that which is, say right, what we currently call our minds, our eminently not Buddhas. If we have done any kind of meditation simply watching our thoughts without controlling them, just seeing what comes up, even on a good day, it will become pretty clear, this is not a perfect mind. This is not a totally pure mind. This is a mind that can go from some wonderful thought of compassion or love or aspiration to some totally innocuous thought of distraction to some impatience to etc. You know your mind. Um, so just a quick look, much less a long-term look at our own minds, reveals that these are not the minds of Buddhists. Uh, and nevertheless, there are many, many sutras, and many of them do come from the latter part of the Buddhist teaching, where he speaks about this essence of all the Buddhas that resides within us. And according to Jason Kappa's understanding, that can be nothing else but the emptiness of our own minds. And we're going to talk about emptiness a lot tonight. But it won't all necessarily be directly, explicitly direct, um, focused on our minds. So what I ask you, and I plan to see right now, in your own meditations, in your own ruminations, Take the examples that we will discuss, whether they be about sticks and snakes, or water and pus and blood, or any other examples that may come up, and at some point direct it inwards. How does this apply to the stream of thoughts in my own mind? And not even the stream of thoughts, but the very fact that my mind is aware. What is that in because that is the key emptiness to understanding what part of ourselves could become a Buddha. And if we don't get that right, then we might be trying to use the wrong material, shall we say, on which to become 
I want to say become enlightened, on, on which to progress along the path. Because if we were to take some part of our ordinary, ordinarily functioning mind as we experience it without probing too deeply, and say, oh, that's the thing that has a real Buddha inside of it. We could very, very easily, all too easily reify or make real, make essential, make into a self the very thing that is the cause of our suffering. And that would be of no use on the path. So to identify that aspect of ourselves, which could, in a perfect stream, become a Buddha, become totally enlightened, as we explored in the meditation, it's essential to be able to pinpoint, to be able to focus in on, to narrow down on what is that emptiness, what is that absence of inherent existence, what is that absence of being this way from its own side, that in turn could be the basis from which our enlightenment could And if we go deeply enough into this question, we will never casually say, I will become a Buddha. Or even I, well, you could say I want to become a Buddha, but you would have to understand that the I who wants that can't become a Buddha. And I'll dare to say that very strongly. There's something in us now that will go on in an unbroken continuum to total enlightenment. But in this system, that's an absence, not a presence. It's an absence of inherently being what we seem to be. Uh, now, there are other ways of interpreting this in different schools of Buddhism, as I say, and we won't go into that now. Um, but it's essential to realize that even in other schools where they may seem to be speaking about a Buddha nature that has some positive qualities such as awareness, that awareness itself is defined to be absolutely empty of any inherent nature. So in the end, you come right back to this um, that, that awareness in other schools is still unconditioned awareness. It's not the awareness we think of when we say, I am aware in an ordinary, everyday, unexamined sense. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions on that right now? Please come back to me if you do. So, according to the homework, we jump now very quickly into the middle way school. Uh, I just want to check very briefly because there's so much content still in the uh, the latter part of the mind only reading. Okay, we'll get back to it. So at this point in the text, uh, and please do reread all of it, um, you see a debate between the mind only and the middle way school from the point of view of the mind only school. So when the middle way person comes into the debate at this point, uh, they're the bad guy, shall we say. They're the opponent. They're the one who's getting it wrong. And it's very salutary, I think, it's very beneficial to be able to look at a middle way view from the point of view of how it looks wrong, not just to anybody, but to the great proponents of the mind only school. And Jason Kabo presents it very finely. Uh, but in this case, when the middle way proponent um, shall we say, presents his view in answer to a, a mind-only question, we still come across a very succinct and, and precise definition of what uh, the ultimate, or Tundampa, um, means from a middle way perspective. And again, we can't go into all the details now, but there's a, a very fine distinction between saying the ultimate and existing ultimately. Uh, because the definition that comes here uh, for the ultimate or ultimate truth, the Nam Dhamma, uh, is Chutam Ji King Wo Ni Me Ba Ni Dunam Dhamma Yin. And the grammar there is very precise. The lack of 
a an essential nature to all existing things is the truth of highest meaning or the ultimate truth. So it's not saying um, I can think of lots of other ways of saying that, but I'll repeat it as is. The fact that no existing thing possesses any essential nature, or the absence of an essential nature in all existing things is ultimate truth. Does that mean that ultimate truth exists ultimately? And I really want somebody to answer here. Does that mean that the ultimate truth exists ultimately? No. Can you say why? Because we conceptualize it to understand it with our present minds. If someone is seeing emptiness directly, does ultimate truth exist ultimately? It seems like it has to. And I'm struggling with the definition. But if you see emptiness directly, <laughs> it's tough. I, it, if you see emptiness directly, it's ultimate. If it's an ultimate yes. truth, mm -hmm. why doesn't it exist? It, in my mind, it has to exist. Ultimately, so, in order for so in, all of us to see it or to experience it, even if it's an absence, doesn't that absence have to exist? Ah, it does exist. And this is where we get into the key between existing and existing ultimately. But we also doesn't say, don't say that emptiness exists deceptively, though there are cases where one can say that. Um, from a mind only school perspective, what does it mean to say that something exists ultimately? That the subject and object come from the same karmic seed? That's one way of saying it, but it's more the reversal of how they don't exist. Uh, so what he's, for those of you who aren't familiar with this whole system, um, and I'm trying to place voices, but I can't always be exactly sure who's spoken, so pardon me if, if I'm speaking the abstract. Um, what he's saying is, the mind only school describes emptiness this way, in terms of normal things. When you look at the wall in front of you, and you think it's an outer object, and you think that it's coming from the bricks and the paint and whatever other materials were put together to make it, and you think that your own mind is coming from its own past moments of mind, and that those are two separate things coming from different sets of causes, then you are thinking that the wall comes from a different seed, a different cause from your own mind. And that is what the mind only school rejects. So it says that the wall is empty of being an outer object insofar as the wall is empty of arising from a different karmic seed, a different cause from your perception of the wall. But if you were to reverse that and recognize that everything one perceives is coming just from a stream of karmic seeds, and that really is what the mind only school says, that all the apparently outer objects, as well as our own bodies, as well as our own minds, are arising from the popping of karmic seeds in a stream. If one were to understand that, 
and used positively, I think it was Master John who said that, was it you? Yes. Yeah. Um, if one were to say positively that the wall exists ultimately because it doesn't come from a separate seed as my mind, I'm not sure that would explain the ultimate reality of the wall in the mind-only school. Because there's another key term that that I'm looking for, that I'm fishing for tonight. Maybe it's, um, the, maybe it's the absence of the self-existent wall, or the absence of the defined from its own side, or defined by, self, by itself outside of your perception of it. Now you're getting towards ultimate reality in the middle way school. Uh-huh. Um, let me just give forget fishing. The positive way in which the mind-only school defines existing ultimately for dependent things, for things we can see, things we can experience, is that they exist through their own defining characteristics. That's the key word, by definition. Through their own defining characteristics. And that can be said very positively. But the key is, and that's why um, the point that Master John made is so important, is the defining characteristics of things are not things we see, according to the mind-only school. So saying that the wall is white is not a defining characteristic. If it's the white that we see in our ordinary states of mind. And this is where it gets really complex. And um, so now I'm just going to go off script a little bit and off the materials that you have, but just try to explain them. This is where we left off last week. So for the mind-only school, the foundation consciousness is a key, key idea. I won't say it's the only key idea because apparently there are are versions of the mind-only school that don't even accept the foundation consciousness, but I haven't studied that and I don't know how it would work. The, The core notion of the foundation consciousness is this eighth consciousness, distinct from any of our sensory consciousness, distinct even from our mental awareness, and also distinct from the parts of our mind that is specifically ignorant of self. That's the the afflictive consciousness that sees the self. But there's this other inchoate, unclear, in the sense that you could never quite see it directly, um, foundation consciousness, which carries the seeds not just of all our past needs, but also of the tendencies to see things in a certain way that we've had from time without beginning. And this is a key idea. It's not only a matter of actions create seeds, create seeds that create experiences, and then our responses to those experiences create new seeds. There are also these tendencies, or bhaktas, as you know the term, these tendencies that apparently we've carried with us from time without beginning. And so when those tendencies express themselves, they're not over. It's not as if just because you see white and you have a word for white and you have, you're able to conceptualize white and you say white, it doesn't mean you've just worn out that seed. You know, we think of seeds in terms of, oh, a, a good deed gives rise to a, a, someone being kind to me, but then once that's over, it's over. Notice that there are these tendencies which will, they don't just end because we use them. In fact, they perpetuate themselves because we use them. And that distinction makes sense. So according to the mind-only school, the objects of our world, and specifically this is always said in relation to a person and the the gateways of a person or the five senses and so on, um, they are arising directly on the basis of the ripening of seeds. And in this case, those are the projected seeds, the the seeds catapulted from the deeds of the past life and to some extent also the the deeds of this life, but mostly from the past. So in that sense, the foundation consciousness is ripening into a world. This is my only school, yeah. But there are these other tendencies. So uh, I'll repeat it. The real world is coming from the tendencies. The real wall is coming from the seeds. And in that case, I'm using seeds and tendencies interchangeably. But then there's this other set of tendencies that make us label things in a certain way. And that's the very capacity to see white. When 
a being with a different kind of sensory apparatus wouldn't see white at all. Um, and if we, and a code blind person might not see white in the same way that a person with what we call normal eyes would. But there's also the tendency to be able to label it, and it even means linguistically label it. When a mother says white, or as Gesha Michael taught very clearly once, when a mother says clock and points at the clock on the kitchen wall, what is it in the child's mind that can recognize the object? And sure, they might not be able to tell time the first day that they learned the word clock, but they're able to recognize that that object has a function and they're able to, as we might say, get their mind around the object as a functioning thing. An entire process of labeling, constructing, imagining, but also making very valid um, constructed labels about things. According to the mind only school, is coming from a different set of tendencies. And so this gives us new perspective on, on the notion of constructs, which is one of the three natures of the, of the mind only school the constructs, the dependent things, and the totality. So that the construct. The constructs really are what arise to the mind on the basis of these tendencies. So those tendencies are still functioning things. The mind is still a changing thing. But the constructs that arise in the mind are unchanging things. Does that make sense? Because uh, this question has come up many times of, well, if the constructs are unchanging, the mind is changing, how can the constructed, is the constructed state of mind something changing or unchanging? And it's very clear in this school that the mind that does the constructing is itself a dependent thing. It's not a construct. The constructs are the things that arise in the mind. But they are so ubiquitous that everything we ever see is veiled by this layer of the unchanging constructs through which we see them. And so, according to the mind-only school, when one thinks that a thing comes from separate causes and doesn't come from the seeds in one's own mind, that's through the veil of these particular kinds of constructs. And so the notion of thinking that dependent things come um, possess from their own side the inherent characteristics of the constructs that we place on them it's very, very close to thinking that the outer object didn't come from a separate seed as the mind that perceives it. Get that? So if you see, one has to almost be pictorial about this. The foundation consciousness is ripening into a world. Ripening, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. Is ripening into objects, sensory powers, and consciousness. That's the world of dependent things. According to Jaito Kappa, you can't even say whether those things are made of mind or not. The whole notion of mind only, which we'll get to more shortly, it doesn't actually mean that form is really mind, because then that would make a parody of the word form as opposed to the word mind. Form doesn't have the same characteristics as mind does. What the mind only school means by everything is nothing more than mind is it didn't come from a separate source than the mind itself. And that's so that same notion of the object didn't come from any other seed than the mind that's perceiving it. So if they have the same cause, how can you say they're separate things? And that's what it means to say that they are not a separate substance. So an object is not a separate substance in the mind that perceives it, not in that they're somehow physical substance stuff. We have a too materialistic word, a notion of the word substance. Though the Tibetan word ze has a very physical connotation to it also, as does the Sanskrit dravya. Um, but it's that they have the same, uh, as Alexander Brzezin calls it, the same natal source, the same birthplace. And I'm going to jump to one point now that Yeshitubin and Rinchen made later, and I was just translating today, actually, from, from Vesel Kappa's text. A substantial thing in this context means a thing where you don't have to look at a lot of different things in order to identify it. 
And so if one really understood what it meant for the mind to be coming from the same seed as the object it perceives, or rather the object it perceives is coming from the same seed as the mind is perceiving it, you wouldn't need to look two different things in order to understand what mind is. Does that make sense? This is a really important point. It's the meaning of no separate substance in the mind only school. You wouldn't have to look at two distinct separate things in order to understand what reality. But we can't access that now because the constructs are in the way. And so when we even talk about things having defining characteristics of their own, we can't see those defining characteristics. That's where I started on this from, and they all fits together so tightly. To say the wall is white is not to, to define its defining characteristics. The real defining characteristics through which the mind-only school will say that the wall exists from its own side through its own unique way of being is the fact that it came from its causes which was a mental seed. Get that? It really came from the mental seed. It does not really have the characteristics that you paste onto it. So it has a real characteristic of growing. And you might even say it has a real characteristic, but the term that the, the mind only school uses for this is the inexpressible identity. Churumebe uh, dai inexpressible identity. And they use the word that me, the very likeness to itself. But it can't be expressed in words. And according to the mind only school, it can really only be seen by those who've seen emptiness directly. Because for those who've seen emptiness directly in that school, they've peeled away the veil of constructs altogether. And so they're seeing a non-dual reality. With all of it, and I can't help but use imagery to say it, with all of its color, colors and shapes and sounds and varieties, but no labels. And no labels that separate those things as being other than the mind, and my mind is here. So that was a long way around, but it's relevant for many issues in this class, to say that when the mind-only school says that ultimate reality exists ultimately, they also mean it exists through defining characteristics of its own. But that doesn't mean you can draw pictures about ultimate reality. So to say that something exists with its own defining characteristics, that's by definition of the mind only school, doesn't it doesn't really have to do with the fact that we can define it. It's talking about how it's defined from its own side. And it's precisely that that the middle way has an issue. When it comes to the process of labeling, the middle school and the and the mind the middle way school and the mind only school have a lot to agree about. What they disagree about is that inexpressible, intangible thing beyond the veil of constructs that pretty much only an Arya is said to be able to see from a mind only point of view. And that the middle way school says, for an Arya, even that won't appear as self existent. Or it may it may still appear as self existent, but it won't be self-existent, and I'll know that. Have I lost everybody, or is, can is I it, see some hands or not? Is yeah. it sort of like, um, I can see a wall, and the construct I'm putting on it is wall, but in the mind-only school, if I were enlightened, just as a sort of gross example, I would be able to see the molecular structure behind it versus, you know, you can see a building mm -hmm. and the construct you put on is this is building, but at enlightenment, you see it as the mechanical drawing of the building. You see what goes into making the whole thing and... I'd love to be able to say yes, but my mind gets, finds a couple of problems with the analogy. But it's important, it's really it's so important to go there. And it's that kind of thinking that will, will get all of us further. So oh, thank you for that. Um, one thing is that I would very much hesitate to talk about enlightenment here, because a Buddha's reality is not coming from seeds. Buddha's reality is created by the two collections, and it just it's off the charts of this whole explanation, because a Buddha doesn't have a foundation consciousness. So you can't even talk about things 
objects coming from seeds that are inseparable from the mind that perceives them when we're talking about a Buddha. It's better for us to speak about uh, someone who's seen emptiness directly, but is still not a Buddha. So someone who's seeing reality, knows how reality works, but they're still subject to seeds. So modify your example that way. I can't answer for the mind-only school because, first of all, they say the outer objects don't exist with particles. It's precisely outer ex objects existing with particles that they reject because they don't like the way that the lower schools define particles. So the lower schools, uh, the Abhidharma in particular, say that there are infinitesimally small, partless particles that don't even have sides, that don't even have direction. They're so small that those are the real constituents of reality. Uh, so you're using the word molecule doesn't necessarily make this a scientific discussion because they were talking about tiny, tiny particles in ancient India and Tibet as well. But when the mind-only school reject outer matter, which they do quite explicitly do, they mean they reject outer matter, matter that could exist based on tiny, partless particles like that. They're not rejecting the notion of form altogether. As I said, form, physical appearances, arise from the foundation consciousness. So I think a more useful analogy, which is what the mind only school does take in this case, would it be a dream. So we can have labels in our dreams. We have plenty of them. But we're a little closer in a perhaps even a lucid dream, which I don't know if any of you have experienced a, a dream where you are aware that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. And it's like you can watch the images unfolding, or even like watching a movie and you're very aware that it's a movie. And you're very aware that those images are unfolding, but they are not really the way they appear because the shapes on the screen are not really the people. And so for the mind-only school, they use the analogy of a dream in order to explain how it is that there can be lots of things happening in our world but you'll never find anything substantial, something physical out there that's made up of particles. So this inexpressible object would perhaps be something like a lucid dream where you're seeing the dream unfold, but you're not fooled by your constructs about it. Is that helpful? Yeah. Uh, so let's just leave that there. Because uh, analyzing molecular structure that we, you just said will take us further in the direction of the middle way to position. Because they do accept outer objects, and they do accept molecular structure. And you can go down to the subatomic <clears throat> particle, and you'll be making very useful pro progress on a middle way inquiry. The mind only school won't want to go there. They say it's just your appearance, it's your mind. That's all you have. Now, a particle physics physicist who has appearances to his mind about um, subatomic particles will have to deal with that also from a mind only perspective, but I don't think we have that practical problem in place yet. Um, so just to continue, because as I say, I'm, I'm making a circle around all these themes and then the specific questions uh, do all relate to them. Um, so we had that little foray in the middle way school, but then go back into the mind only school. For the middle way school, ultimate reality is the fact that all things lack a nature of their own, or no thing has an inherent essential identity. The mind only school has a big problem with that in several ways. Yeah. Um, they say that if you say that, that uh, dependent things, namely walls and people and, and trains and buses and, and food, etc., and our own minds, dependent things. If you say that they don't have any essential identity of their own, then not only do you denigrate functioning reality, you'll also denigrate emptiness and constructs, the other two natures of the mind-only school. Because if you denigrate those um, dependent things, then what, pray tell, is there to put constructs on top of? The mind only school is essential to have the basis that's really ripening from real mental seeds. And then the constructs get planted on top of it. 
But if there's no basis, if you, if you say that dependent things don't even have a nature of their own, you have nothing to plant the constructs and then say the mind only school. Everything is just um, made up of your mind, like sky flowers, like rabbit's horn. There's no basis in reality. And for them also, that would completely undermine the notion of karma because for them, karma has to be coming from seeds that have natures of their own that give rise to their results. But they say not only would you be denigrating constructs, you'd be denigrating um, emptiness. Because in the mind only school, as Jetson Kappa understands it and interprets it and is very vehement that anybody who doesn't understand the, the sutra that way hasn't studied the sutra or Master Sanger's commentaries carefully enough, is that Emptiness is simply the fact that the dependent things don't possess the constructs inherently. So that proves to us what, I was, what we were saying a moment ago, which is the characteristics the dependent things possess inherently are not the constructs we have about them, are not the white, the square, the space, etc. All those constructs, that's, that's the stuff that is ephemeral. The real defining characteristics of dependent things are what they have from their own side, but are inexpressible. No, uh, we can't really touch them. Um, but emptiness is just seeing that from the moment it was created by its causes, that thing had no identity uh, of possessing its constructs from its own side. And it had no self in the sense of being unchanging and coming from itself. So if you say there are no dependent things, you have no definition for emptiness in the mind school. But for the middle way, when you go to look for the dependent thing, you'll never find it. And that's how you get to emptiness. And the only way you can define emptiness is the fact that there is no nature there. And that comes back to this ultimate truth, it refers to emptiness, which is the fact that no existing object has a self-nature. Um, but back to our original question, which will always be a sticking point, why can ultimate reality in the middle way school not exist ultimately? Well, one, from a, back to this terminology, the fact that nothing has a nature of its own doesn't have defining characteristics of its own. <laughs> Say that again. The fact that nothing has a nature of its own is not a fact with its own defining characteristics. It's not a real thing that functions. <coughs> it, and that's the real point, is you can't reify emptiness. You can't turn emptiness into a thing with its own nature. It's a simple absence. And even in the minority school, simple absences can't have their own nature. <coughs> Except Yongu. Or totality, they want that to have its own nature. <laughs> we'll just leave that. That's mind only school now. Because <coughs> they have the mind only school, they do say that emptiness has its own nature. Because they say, how could it be the ultimate reality that leads you to, to an end of all your spiritual obstacles? How could it lead you to the end of suffering if it didn't really exist? Uh, the slippery and incredibly profoundly important thing about emptiness in the middle way school is when you look for the emptiness that gets the name, you will never find it either. That's all. Even perceiving emptiness directly, you will never find the thing that gets the name emptiness. Another way of saying that, which, which I'm relying on Gisha Michael's oral transmission for, I haven't seen this in the text, I don't think, um, is if emptiness had characteristics of its own, then everybody would see it that way. And of course we don't. And there are countless people who have never even heard of it. Um, so that means that it doesn't literally come from its own side. The very direct perception of emptiness in some way is related to the perceiver. I don't want to say it's dependent on the perceiver because emptiness is not dependent on anything. But it couldn't be seen without the perceiver. That's all. And I say that's all, but it's so important that uh, there's a phrase, and I actually don't know its source, but Pablo Verapache uses it in his uh, law room that Kishimaiko's been teaching all these years in Arizona, 
and Mexico. Um, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to say it right. Well, the one image that comes to mind is if you if you're able to even chink away a tiny bit and you're grasping to some nature of thing, then eventually, with one bl blow, Mount Meru itself will dis dissolve, disintegrate. But I think they use the image of Mount Meru the other way for this one as well, which is that if you think that emptiness exists inherently, um, this is the most drastic of all wrong views. Because you'll never be able to get out of it. If you have given an inherent nature to the very thing that was going to cut through all grasping to an inherent nature, as, as Arya Nagarjuna says, it's like taking a snake by the wrong end. It's a lot of different metaphors, but you get my point. You, you're the very thing that was going to free you you have now take it as your own poison. Because to hold to emptiness is something inherently existing, even at the very, very subtle level of levels of meditation would create an obstacle uh, to stop one from seeing it, seeing it directly. I don't expect to prove that right now, but let's just leave that at the point. Uh, a little bit more, and we'll take a break. So we have a little foray into both mind only and middle ways notion of ultimate reality. Uh, and then the middle way notion of deceptive reality. Uh, there's a very long discussion in the text, which again, you can go back to course 15 to read the whole of. Uh, but People still have a lot of problems with this word, deceptive reality, because it gets applied even to very sacred things. And somehow, uh, does anyone still feel uncomfortable with calling uh, the holy body of a Buddha deceptive reality? Does that bother anybody? Well, you're all so well trained. <laughs> um, you may be aware that a lot of uh, Western books about Dharma don't call it deceptive reality, they call it conventional reality. And um, that misses a lot of point because there is a word for convention, and that's sanyi. That's the way that things are merely, merely labeled through names and terms and conventions. But when the word deceptive reality is used, it really means, uh, in Sanskrit, it's samvritti satya, that which is veiled, that which is covered over. And the Tibetan, hundo, hundo literally means. Um, totally false, totally fake, totally lying to you. Uh, but the point here to, to remember specifically is that deceptive reality is only deceptive insofar as it appears to a mind which is deceived. Does that feel better? It's not the reality that's inherently, obviously, deceptive. It's that certain minds are deceived about the way things appear. And the reality is deceptive to those minds. Now, from a middle way perspective, it's almost easier to describe this for mind only. Again, mind only is almost always more complicated. Um, middle way, it's simply that a thing appears as though it has an inherent nature of its own, and really it doesn't. That's the problem. Um, now there's a phrase in the answer key here which I won't hesitate to say because you've all heard it hundreds of times. This reality is called deceptive because it seems to be one way, i.e. self-existent, but is really something else that is a projection forced on us by our karma. A phrase familiar, projection forced by our karma. I will admit that I've made it my modus operandi, shall we say, for a number of years now. 
to find where in scripture it will describe a middle way view of reality just like that. Because you will see countless places where it describes the fact that the middle way view is that nothing has any nature of its own. All things lack existing through any inherent characteristics of their own. They fail to exist truly, inherently, etc. And you will see countless descriptions of, of how karma causes things. But the particular, unique, and sacred oral transmission from Yeshua and Michael about the fact that emptiness is the lack of a thing not being the result of our karmic projections is unique oral instruction. And I, I feel quite confident to say that now. But it is not unfounded in scripture. And I'm going to skip to a later part of the class um, in order to explain that point. But I'll do it after the break. Is everybody a little bit tired now? <laughs> yes, no? Sure. Yeah. Sure, break. Mm -hmm. um, let's just do a quick one, just 10 minutes. And, and come back at uh, 9.